All right, we are down the home stretch the last few sessions. We're making our way back to the East Coast of the, of the US slowly. And we got Christian Ortiz kicking us off. Um, he's gonna talk about ankle instability. I wanna thank Ardalan for sponsoring this session and Christian, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Celine, for this kind invitation. We're moving into the ankle instability section. We have a great group of speakers today. Uh, beginning with Eric Gisa, professor in UC Davis, Sacramento, chief of foot and ankle surgery, former soccer player and team physician for the Sacramento Republic FC, and also member of the ankle instability group. Uh, similar thing from Jorge George Acevedo, director of the foot and ankle center of excellence with Southeast orthopedic specialists. Uh, he also has a degree in biomedical engineer. He is of, well known by being a co-inventor of the arthroscopic lateral ligament repair system, president elect of the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Minimally Invasive Surgery Society, and also part of the Ankle Instability Group. My very well, very very good friend Gabriel Casson from Caracas, Venezuela. He's uh, right now the president of the South American uh, Foot and Ankle Society. And my partner, we work together here in Chile. Uh, he is the chief of foot and ankle surgery in one of the hos main hospitals here. And we also work together in Clinica Andes, Santiago, Chile. He is part of the board of the Foot and Ankle Chilean Society. And he was a former, former, uh, former Duke University fellow. So when we talk about ankle instability, and you, you all you all guys have seen this picture um, uh, taken by Paul Colano, uh, just to keep in mind that when we talk about ankle instability, it's not just lateral, it's probably mainly lateral, but we need to think about multidirectional, that means medial, uh, syndesmotic, and sometimes uh, subtalar and others. Uh, we need to think about the concept of microinstability. It's a different scenario if we're treating primary and if we're going into surgery, we need to think about arthroscopic, open, and if we try any of these, what specific technique or modification you want to do. If you have a recurrent case, you're probably going to change your strategy and that's what we want to know. What about when you have malalignment like varus deformity, when you would go and correct uh, and add an osteotomy, comorbidities, does that influence your decision when you have an obese patient, when you have an athlete, and when would you add augmentation with something like an internal brace, or when would you replace everything with an allograft? So uh, this is a, an easy case, no, no surprises, female, 30-year-old, Ankle pain and instability, recurrent instability. The last one, the last event was two months earlier. Uh, and of course, she didn't get better with conservative treatment. She, she's um, she's um, a hockey player. So these are the x-rays. You can see an OCD. And uh, he, besides the OCD, uh, you see this is what it looks like intraoperatively, the arthroscopic, we did some derivement and treated the OCD, but one of the main issues here is the, the ankle instability. So for this young lady that uh, is part of, uh, she, she, is, she plays hockey at a very good level. So I would like to know what you would do with this case. Actually, this is Manuel, Okay, so I would like to ask uh, Eric what he would do. Sure, I think this is, although although straightforward, these are the ones that then can come back around. You can fix their instability, but um, obviously you want to fix the instability and the osteochondral lesion at the same time. Now, uh, other question for you: would, Did she complain only of the of the mechanical instability, or was she complaining of also that you know that kind of deep toothache pain that um, 
that Van Dyke described originally, you know, for what we know is is an osteochondral defect. That, that, that's a very good question. You can you can clearly make the difference on clinical testing and clinical after talking. She was never complaining of that typical deep pain. We'll make it easier, no doubt. The only thing for her was the instability. Okay. So, and then how about posterior pain or a crunch test when you hyperplanar flex? Because she also had an astragonum. No, no posterior pain, just some anterior pain, persistent anterior pain, and severe instability. I think in my hands, um, I would still treat this osteochondral defect because uh, it was already cystic what it, from what it looked like. And so um, I would probably, and, and I don't want to sound like a, start off by sounding like a broken record already, but I would... Uh, our new technique that, that Chris Krulin and I prefer is, is taking out the cartilage cap, assuming they didn't have already have a, um, a previous surgery and then mincing up or chopping the cartilage cap into little pieces, like making your own autograft and then bone grafting, and then putting that back, mixing it with, um, a material here called biocartilage that we have in the, the U S and, and that's been kind of our go-to for treating these lesions. And then, of course, I would, I would um, depending on the amount of instability and whether, you know, her CFL was very loose on lateral tilt testing, I would consider doing an, an open repair at the same time. Uh, I know that from our study with, with George Acevedo that certainly when you're doing an OCD, do I find it easier to do an arthroscopic lateral ligament stabilization, but whether or not it'd be enough for her um, based on the amount of instability you're, you're talking. Would you ever add something like an internal brace? What would, yeah. would be your indication to add that? Um, I, I Internal brace, I, I certainly use very frequently, probably at least 50% of the time or more um, be, due to how long they're, the, how long they've had their instability and whether or not they're, they're trying to get back to competitive sports. And it sounds like this patient has both, that she still wants to be competitive and she's had very yes. long instability. So, so no, not unreasonable to do that. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to move, move back to Gabriel. Now that you mentioned, Eric, the issue about the osteochondral defect, I'm going to make it up here, Gabriel. So let's guess that we have a spexity with no signal at the area of the OCD. Let's guess that we have an MRI with no, no edema at the OCD. Would you ever, in this scenario, where is no clinical symptoms of, an, of the OCD, just gross, gross instability, would you ever leave the OCD untouched? That's a great I don't know question. if you got my, my question. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And we always have the doubt with this, but my concern here is that it's a big cyst. So I'm concerned for the future. And maybe I want to graft it anyway, although it might not be symptomatic. But I, I'd be very keen to do something, even if it's, it's not you know painful now. I'm concerned for the future of that huge cyst in a poor girl. Okay, what if you see that uh, under the arthroscopic vision, the OCD uh, is a little is, is is clearly stable? I know it's rare, but let's say it is stable. If you want to graft it, would you do like a retrograde drilling and retrograde bone grafted? Would you ever do that? Correct. Yeah, that's what I would do if it's if it's stable as you just said. Okay, now I'm going to move to I'm going to move to Manuel. Manuel. Uh, now that we're talking about this, we, I know we have discussed this many times uh, in, in the hospital, but I'm going to ask you something new that I've never asked you before. Uh -huh. Let's say the same scenario I'm making up right now. Let me repeat. Mm -hmm. Severe instability, national hockey player, 30 years old. Uh, she does, have any, does not have any symptoms coming from the OCD, MRI, no edema. Spexity, no edema. You get inside, and the the uh, the cartilage it looks intact, but it's very soft. So, 
Would you rather remove the cartilage? Would you prefer to lift it up the way Gino Kerkhoff does? Lift it up the cartilage, bone graft, put it back again, or would you bone graft, or you would do nothing? What would you do about the OCD in this scenario? Well, talking about the question, what if you have a comorbidity associated with your ankle instability? This is for to give you more time to think. Yes, no, this is a, this is a very great question. Actually, the problem that we had with this patient is that uh, she was to po supposed to be playing for the uh, classification for the Olympic Games in five or six months. So we knew that if we touch the, the cartilage, she will be definitely out of the process and will be out of the national team. So obviously that was something that we had in, in mind in order to decide what to do. But I agree with Gabriel. I think that uh, the future of this lesion is uh, it's very, very scary, at least. Even if it doesn't um, uh, highlight anything in the spec CT or, or in the MRI. But just uh, addressing the question that you are, are saying, if the, if, the, if the cartilage is only soft, but isn't unstable, meaning that by, the, by this that you don't see that the lesion is like kind of floating or or moving when you when you just cope in, in a scenario where the, the patient doesn't have any pain, I will leave it alone. For, a, for, for this type of patient, we're talking about a professional hockey player that needs to be back on the field as soon as she can. So I, I wouldn't touch the, the lesion uh, if uh, she didn't have uh, any pain. If she has pain or the spec CT is um, it's highlighting the lesion, that's a different scenario. But if it doesn't, I will leave it alone. Okay, thank you, Manuel. Now, my friend, George, let, let me hear your opinion about the OCD and then you will enlighten us about the lateral ligament reconstruction in this specific case. But let me, let me hear your opinion about the OCD. So as far as OCD, I, <clears throat> I agree with what Eric said. I would, I would uh, take it down to a stable board or bone grafted and probably uh, use the, the biocartilage that we have here in the States. Um, that's kind of my standard go-to uh, for this, this type of scenario. Um, so you, excuse me, George. So you don't care if there is no edema, if there is no symptoms, if there is no uh, signal in a spec CT. It doesn't, none of those facts matter anything to you. No, they, they I, do. Is that they too do. much? <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I exaggerating too much? Oh, that's okay. Um, uh, they do, but if there's softening of the cartilage, then I think you have to address the softening of the cartilage, is, is my opinion. How about what Gino Kirkup does? Uh, just uh, making a little bit of a, of a hole on one side of the cartilage, lift it up and put some bone graft and then close it and fix it with whatever you want, some fiber and glue or something like that. Do you like that's, that idea? That's, that's an interesting concept. And I, I, I unfortunately have no experience doing that. So. Okay. So that, uh, I brought this up. I know uh, OCDs has been discussed, but it's something that is, is typically combined with uh, our instability. Now, specifically talking about the instability. Yes. Brostrum, arthroscopic brostrum, open brostrum with internal brace. What combination would you, would you do in this specific national so uh, hockey Chilean player? Good looking. So... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what so, the hell that has to do with the decision, but you know, sometimes it may we have to make a good looking ankle. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to assume that um, uh, it's mainly uh, ATFL, although um, I would, I would do this regardless. Um, I would do, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say something a little bit heretical, but I would do uh, definitely do, um, the uh, arthroscopic brostrum and uh, augmented with an internal brace. And I, r right now, as you know, I'm doing that arthroscopic as well. And but if for some reason I couldn't, then I I wouldn't hesitate to do a mini open approach, and and do the internal brace. But I think a, a high demand athlete. That's actually one of my indications for the internal brace. 
Great. So uh, that's uh, precisely what Manuel did. He added the, the internal brace. Uh, uh, right now, there's not just one company that has this. So it's, 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 uh, it's something that you add besides your suture. Of, co of course, you have to suture. And then you add this. Uh, some people, yeah, like James Calder, they say that if you do it arthroscopically or or in an open fashion, it's absolutely the same. But of course, it's nicer if you can perform the same thing arthroscopically or with minimal incisions. So uh, this is her. Uh, this is kind of a long video, but you're going to see at the at the end the one who who scored scores the goal, and maybe Manuel is able to remind me how far away from surgery when when this video taken just make it up you don't have to no no uh, I think it's okay so it's, it's, it's your case if, if something someone is going to make it up i will let you make it up no no it's it's 9 weeks of of sur from surgery so i was a okay. uh, very nice so okay that's that's very interesting because I, i'm going to show you one case of a guy who who is not a competitive competitive athlete, but he wanted to go back to his uh, sports very quickly. And you're going to see him uh, uh, two weeks after surgery. I just removed the stitches. He's moving like this, and he's walking in the hall like this without any external brace. It's a similar it's a similar situation. That's what we typically do as a, a, a post op recovery. And this is another case from Giovanni, another one of our partners. This is a bilateral case. He's training, he's a soccer player, professional one, six weeks after the same surgery. So for the ones who are not uh, very familiar with this kind of augmentation, uh, we, I guess everyone in this panel has, uh, well, at least most of you guys have a lot of experience with uh, this kind of augmentation and it does seem to make a difference uh, we need probably to emphasize that we have no idea what is going to happen in 30 years old in 30 years with these cases uh, we have seen some irritations from the anchors and we have seen that if the technique is not done properly you may actually create some stiffness or some other issues like impingement and adding some uh, some material, you may even increase the risk of infection or, or simple irritation. So I would like to know everyone's every in a, from every one of you the indication to add an internal brace. And I, I'm going to begin with uh, um, with uh, George. He said uh, an elite athlete or a competitive athlete he would do it what about the rest of the things that i point, pointed out here bilateral or someone who is just asking to recover earlier or whatever i mean what are your indications to have an internal brace so i i think that if you have somebody who for example in 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 uh, a lot of i see a lot of workers comp patients that want to get back to work sooner uh, or have a job that requires them to be uh, very physically active, like some of my police officers, I, I, I definitely would not hesitate to do uh, an internal brace. Um, so, and, and the other uh, uh, area that I see a lot is uh, people with hyperlaxity. Um, those, those people I've, I've been, through the years I've been burned because uh, I thought the Arthur Rusham could do it. And, um, and I, I, I now do a Baton uh, score, Baton test uh, on everybody, and I make sure that they can't put their thumb to their forearm. And uh, if they can, they get an internal brace. Jorge, there's a question for you specifically. Have you ever used the internal brace for the CFL? I have. Um, and um, you got you to gotta be a little bit careful with that, uh, Celine. Because uh, as you know, it could cause perineal irritation if you're if you're not placing that correctly. Um, uh, if if I if I feel like there's a significant uh, CFL involvement, I I as much as I don't love doing uh, tendon reconstruction, and I'm sure we're going to get to that uh, in this discussion, um, I I almost think that's a better operation. 
for the, in that specific scenario. Okay, how about you, Eric? Your indications for internal brace? Yeah, very, very similar to what uh, George mentioned. Um, certainly, my our, our, you know, the big athletes, the American football players, you know, in Chile, the rugby players, um, I, I tend to definitely use an internal brace, not just because they're large, but because they can rehab faster. Um, so I use it very frequently. And then even in my older patients who just want to get back to life quicker, where I don't use it as much is I, I'm very particular about my physical exam. Um, I always test the patient for an anterior drawer, but I feel the best way to really test their CFL and the remainder of their ligament complex is to have them prone on the on the exam table with their feet hanging over the edge. And it relaxes, it helps them relax their peroneal tendons because a lot of these patients are in peroneal spasm or when you go to do your anterior drawer, they they tense up. So um, if I feel there's a significant amount of CFL involvement, then I'll, I'll tend towards the using the internal brace. Um, and for those patients who have an OCD but with just more micro instability, then I do the arthrobrostrum uh, alone. But my construct is not usually, I usually, I almost always reconstruct the CFL and we can get into that. Um, but um, I, I, I like to include the CFL, but the internal brace for me, I just have going over the ATFL uh, portion almost all the time as George has said, a couple of rare cases where I've run it um, with the CFL. That's a very interesting question from Celine. Um, Gabriel, would you add or take any of the indications that were mentioned? Yeah, more or less the same. Maybe very heavy patients, I will also consider it. Very heavy guys. But besides that, not much to add that what George has said. Okay, so I guess we all pretty much agree. Manuel, would you like to add something to your indications? Sure. So for me, something that I learned from George and from Eric is that you know that doing your open brostrum or your arthroscopic brostrum is going to be pretty much the same. They tested biomechanically, so you know that that's not going to make the difference. But I, what I, I always look for is for some reason for that patient to fail their primary brostrum. So if you think that there's some, for some reason, that patient is going to fail your primary brostrum, meaning that you're doing it open or arthroscopic, I will augment with an internal brace. And that's uh, it's pretty much how I, I, I address the problem. So anything that makes me feel that we, I'm going to have a problem, I will definitely add something to augment the, the my repair. Well, people in this panel have a lot of experience with the, this kind of augmentation. Would you like to tell us what kind of complications you have seen? Because I've seen very few. We have seen with Manuel irritation. Uh, we have seen associated infections. Uh, and we have heard that some people uh, had the need to remove anchors and some people found uh, like uh, stiffness and they had to, they have done different things like even just cut the internal brace with a minimally invasive incision. Have you seen any other things or do you want to point out any specific technical tip in order to prevent any complication? This, this, this question is open for anyone in the panel. I, I would say I've seen, these weren't my cases, but ones that were sent to me from surgeons who had very poor experience even being surgeons. And um, so one of them put the internal brace through, through the lateral process of the talus and into the subtalar joint. That one I found confusing, but I revised that. And another one... <laughs> put it in into the cartilage on the lateral body of the talus again, but it does, if for those who are listening in and haven't done it before, it's worthwhile just 
you know, doing a cadaver lab or, or watching the training, depending, um, or, or even on a sawbones. Because the, the key is to make sure you're, you're putting that on the neck of the talus in, in the correct position. And I, I will, for that case, uh, you know, it, it's, it takes just maybe an extra minute or two, but I, I, I will usually put my wire in and just confirm that it's right in the center of the Taylor body. Um, and that way you won't have uh, any any complications. And I, I agree with Christian and Manuel. We, I haven't seen many complications at all. I don't think it creates an increased infection rate. I think the times I've ever had an infection, it's not because of the internal brace. It's, it would have, you know, just from typical infection post-operative rate. I have two questions, guys, that have come in. One, the internal brace, do you put it over or under? the inferior extensor retinaculum, and two, do you use it on an ehlers stanlos patient, and does that change your post, uh, post-op protocol and weight bearing? George, do you want to answer that, please? Um, sure. So that's a great question, Celine. Um, uh, actually, when I first started doing the internal brace, and this is arthroscopically, I was putting it over the inferior extensor retinaculum because I, I, I didn't want to... Um, uh, you know, I, I was concerned about irritation of the internal brace being intraarticular. Uh, but uh, my my dear friend James McWilliams uh, proved me wrong, and I um, I I we we were about to actually reported in in the Foot Society meeting on our first eighty seven cases of it being intraarticular with with really minimal uh, complications. So. So now I primarily put the internal brace um, sort of intraarticular or beneath the inferior extensor retinaculum. Um, and, um, uh, and then your other question was uh, on Erlos Danlos, I would do the internal brace. Yes, that, that's actually one of my indications for the internal that brace. That means your post op protocol. Do you hasten it or delay it? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm part of a mass staff group, and I'm probably the most conservative guy in the mass staff group. So my my rehab protocol is not as accelerated as as um, you know some of those that you see out there. I I still keep people you know off of it for the first two weeks, and uh, specifically with with the Erlos Danlos, I I would delay it a little bit, uh, but the internal brace really lets you get them going at at about four weeks, you know, three to four weeks. Um, so, um, and, and I related to your question and related to Christian's prior question about, you know, what kind of complications, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the one time or not the one time I, I'm, there's been par some irritation of the sutures, but, um, there has been a patient where I, I didn't pick up on the fact that the CFL was, was incompetent and uh, the internal brace actually failed. So um, that's a that's a situation where that you really got to look at and um, and then your your bailout for that is, at least for me is a, is a tendon uh, reconstruction. Hey, Christian. Or can, I, can I ask you sorry sorry Ceylon it just brought up one other point about the because I'm still I've still been too you know scared to put it intraarticular. Are you putting it um, under the IER, but above the ATFL, essentially, kind of correct. stitching through. That's correct. Okay. So it's not completely inside the ankle joint next to the, the talus cartilage surface. It's it's right on the, uh, I have a nice picture of it I could show you. It's right on the ATFL. So the beauty of doing it arthroscopically, as you, everybody on the panel knows, is that you, um, you, know, you get a magnified view and you you can really see the ATFL perfectly, and and as the Europeans you know have taught me, um, you know you could really you know dissect the the capsule and the IER off of the ATFL um, if you need to. Okay, excellent. So I, I know we can discuss a lot of things, but I would like to move into this case that was. Uh, is actually George's case. 
if you allow me, George, uh, please go ahead and introduce the case and I will move the slides for you. So uh, this is an older case of mine. It's a 17 year old um, college prospect that um, I had seen prior to this injury for recurrent instability. And, um, and then she, um, I, I don't recall if it was an MBA or, um, or she fell into a hole, but she had this acute dislocation. Um, so did you want, you want to take it from here, Christian? Yes, let me, let me interrupt you for a second. Most of the time, uh, this may happen in the field and someone reduces the, the dislocation and they come to you with a, 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 an isolated ligament rupture, complete rupture, of course. And what if we are talking about, let's say, a professional soccer player? So I would like to know what is your indication to perform surgery in an isolated, complete or full ankle sprain. Of course, this is an obscene case with an obscene deformity and we will go and move on to see the whole case. But uh, it, put yourself in a situation that you see the elite athlete with a severe and complete ankle sprain, everything is ruptured but it's reduced. But you may see what I'm going to show you next, which is like this picture. It looks like an ankle sprain. But then if you, you tried some uh, stress test, you immediately see and feel that it's very and severely unstable on physical examination. So I'm asking this because I used to think that I would never perform any surgery in an acute ankle uh, ligament injury. But right now I think differently. I would like to know your opinion. Let's begin with Gabriel. Gabriel, would you ever operate in, a, in an acute sprain in an elite athlete? Well, as you just said, I mean, I will always think that I would never do surgery in a grade three, for example. But of course there are exceptions, as you just said, this patient, uh, professional player, professional soccer player, with this cross um, lesion, I would do surgery for sure. Acute surgery in this patient, yeah. Okay, how about you, Manuel? So, uh, player from Betis, Betis in Spain. <laughs> so I guess the the issue here is that we're not talking about an ankle sprain. This is formal, this is a formal multi-directional ankle instability and you will find OCDs, you will find perineal tendon injuries, you will find loose bodies. So i um, definitely move forwards. And if this is a high demand patient, I will proceed with surgery without, uh, uh, without uh, delaying for non-orthopedic, uh, non-surgical treatment. Okay, that's, that's a very good point because we, the likelihood that we find associated injuries is very high. And we should probably include uh, some other testing like MRI in case we, look, we see a perineal tendon injury or something else or a fracture or something. Um, so this is what it looks under the MRI. Uh, There's compromise on the lateral side, the medial side. And this is the arthroscopic evaluation. Maybe, George, you want to tell us, tell us what you saw. Uh, these are just pictures. I didn't get any videos. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Um, okay. I, um, so what you're looking at obviously is the medial side and uh, the, the you know, complete disruption of the deltoid. And, um, and then over in, in the inferior picture, you see the uh, posterior tib uh, exposed, which is what you commonly see when, when the, post, when the uh, deltoid is completely ruptured. Uh, what I'm not showing you here is that, as Manuel astutely uh, uh, pointed out, there was also a lateral uh, Taylor osteochondral lesion that was addressed as well. As a, you can see over here. Yeah. So we can move on. And this is what you did. Maybe you can ex explain us your arthroscopic technique for the medial and from the lateral side. Yeah, so um, uh, basically, uh, 
uh, Giza and, and Krulin, uh, we, we put our, our cases together and we actually published this technique. Uh, but basically, you're, you're going in through the inferior uh, medial malleolar region uh, to put your anchor uh, through this uh, er area. Um, and basically the same exact way as you do an arthroscopic lateral ligament repair. And initially we used one anchor, but, uh, in, especially in an athlete like this, I, I do two anchors. Um, and basically, um, uh, the first one goes in the, uh, anterior colliculus. Um, and then the second one can go in, into the posterior colliculus or the intercollicular groove, uh, depending on the spacing. Um, and, uh, and then these are brought out through the intramedial, uh, portal, and then they're passed, um, just, um, uh, between the saphenous vein, essentially, and the posterior tid, um, uh, with a, uh, passing, um, uh, device like a suture passer, um, and they're brought out. Uh, through the skin, you make a small half centimeter incision, and then you could tie them down. And and so so basically, you're tying down the um, the uh, tibio navicular portion of the of the deltoid, and then we think we do get some of the anterior, the deep anterior fibers of the uh, delt of the deltoid as well. And so it's it's a little bit of a judgment call on if you think that's going to be enough. And knock on wood, most of the time it is. Okay, so Christian, one I'm other going question. to more. Oh, sure. Sorry. Just just for the for our viewers, I mean, I, where I've seen these most frequently, where you have bad medial and lateral instability, for me in this region are gymnasts. I I, I've, I can think of maybe five or six in the last ten years at UC Davis. Um, but it begs the question, just for because a lot lots of people are watching, say. Hey, I don't see elite athletes. Where where these guys keep getting all these professional sports people to come see me? So so I had this injury in a girl, and it was her very last gymnast competition ever. She was a senior. She was graduating, and she was moving to Vegas to go to grad school. And so is she now an, not an elite athlete? Would we not fix that? But it begs the question that I think in almost everybody, when you had maybe not as severe as what what George just showed. But you have a construction worker, and you have both deltoid and and lateral ligament tears. That, for me, I, I say, regardless of who you are, I fix that. Hey, that's, that's a very interesting point. Christian, I have a question that's for you. It says, in the presence of a capsular or a ligamentous OCD, so I think it's the one right next to the to the capsule that's been ruptured. Um, are, do you think they're symptomatic because the pressure in the joint is lower and then after the ligament repair occurs, it gets worse because the pressure in the joint gets worse? To be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> but I, I do believe that the pressure may have an influence in the symptoms. And uh, I guess we all have seen that when you repair the ligaments, people just seem to feel better and the, the OCDs, they seem to uh, have less, less recurrences. In, a, in, a, in, a, in some webinars that I have been together with uh, Jordi Vega, uh, uh, he, insists, he insists that uh, he has never seen any recurrence of OCDs after he repairs the micro instability or the gross instability. I think it's a little bit too much to say that you are never going to see a recurring OCD, but he may be right to some point that when you repair the ligaments and consider, consider the medial and the lateral side, uh, you're taking care of the instability and you probably, for some other reasons, are protecting your OCD at the same time. I don't know if anyone would like to add something or a comment because we don't know, we don't have all the answers for this. Um, so, okay, I'm going to move on and show uh, the, the rest of the pictures. This is actually uh, the one you have in your paper. It's in Food and Ankle International 2020. The authors were George Krulin. I don't know why Eric was not in the article anyway, but uh, uh, Krulin got to be there. 
with Cayonari and and his friends. I get left and, uh, out. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you were involved anyway, physically or emotionally. So that's the Very arthroscopic good. view and the anchor, uh, putting the anchor in the medial malleolus. And this is a diagram of the classical brostum technique, arthroscopic brostum described by George. And you actually perform the medial side in a similar way. So Gabriel, are you doing arthroscopical repair of the deltoid? We are not doing that in Chile, but, but after this talk, I guess we are going to do it. Manuel, <laughs> don't you think so that we, we might consider that? Yeah. How about you, Gabriel? Do you not typically for, perform? Not for the delta ligament, not for the delta ligament. I have no experience with that. But it, it seems a bit like a pretty straightforward technique, isn't it, George? This is this yes, is the I, pictures. I think I think what you got to keep in mind is that your safe zone, which we describe in that article that you mentioned, uh, is a little bit more narrow. So just you got to keep in mind your safe zones as you do when you when you when you do the lateral uh, uh, arthroscopic brostrum. There's a, a narrower safe zone. You know, on the lateral side, as you know, there's there's you know greater than four centimeter width zone, whereas in the medial side, there's about two centimeter width. And, you know, um, most of the time you're, you're, you know, you're worried about the posterior tib and, and engaging the posterior tib. So you got to make sure you don't uh, uh, involve the posterior tib. George, have you had any problems uh, with uh, maybe when the, I know it's, it's, a, it's rare, but that sometimes it can, the delta can be detached from the distal side. So if it's detached from there, how will you approach uh, this uh, situation using your arthroscopic uh, technique? That's a great question, Manuel. And um, there, that's not very common. Uh, I've, I've seen it uh, maybe once or twice and I've, and I've used the uh, internal brace in that situation. So I, I um, uh, that's because, because doing it the other way around is a little bit more difficult. So um, I've, I've done it. I've actually done that. I have a picture of it. Uh, and the internal brace has worked quite well on that side. Hey, George, there's a question for you. When do you decide to do a medial deltoid ligament repair? Um, if, obviously, there's gross instability, you will. But if an MRI shows a sprain, is that enough for you to go after it? That's what no, I, I, so uh, if Christian can go back to, to our series, um, basically, there, there's really the two main indications, as you can see there, are those people with, you know, um, you know rotational uh, instability uh, and persistent ankle or, or whatever and, and pain uh, or ankle fractures. So uh, with, with the ankle fractures, as, as several uh, of your colleagues, actually, Celine, have shown, um, you know, the, the repairing the deltoid is, is quite effective and, and in some cases equivalent to, uh, to repairing the syndesmosis. But sometimes you got to do both. Uh, but anyway, the two situations would be in ankle fractures and in purely uh, ligamentous instability, rotational instability, or multidirectional instability. Um, I, I, I don't uh, want to anybody to get the, you know, the misconception that we're repairing every deltoid strain, uh, you know, even, even though it's simple to do arthroscopically, I, I still err on, on um, I, I, I don't know that there's the micro instability that Jordy has described on the lateral side, which I, I do believe exists. Thank you, George. So let's move into another uh, situation in which you have someone that presents to you with a, besides the chronic ankle instability, male, 35 years old, with, but this guy has an asymmetric cable's foot and an OCD. And uh, this is the way it looks. Of course, some bony impingement, some varus at the level of the ankle. Uh, you can see I, in the Salzman view, some varus 
also of the hind foot, the MRI showing the injury, uh, the OCD. This is the case without a high signal in the OCD, but this is the arthroscopic image. Um, so in this case, you combine different things, the instability and OCD, but we're also adding the malalignment uh, situation. So under which circumstances would you correct the alignment? Uh, and when would you never correct the alignment? And if you're going to correct the alignment, and if you have a flexible hind foot, would you consider just performing uh, first metatarsal dorsiflexion osteotomy, or you will always add a calcaneal osteotomy? And when would you add a supramalar? I think Christian's frozen there. Are we are we all frozen? No, we're good. Um, well, I think um, what Christian was talking about this asymmetrical um, cables deformity. We have to think first what's causing it, and we get to see in these patients with some lateral instability, they may have some peroneal tendon problems, and if we get to see this asymmetrical. Um, cables deformity, I will address it as well. So I will do a calcaneal osteotomy, look for the perineal tendons and do the lateral ligament reconstruction. That would be an indication for me to do that. I don't know if uh, George or Manuel or Eric want to say something about I agree. That. I would do a calc osteotomy in this setting. Um, particularly, um, you know, the, Christian, to mention the super malleolar osteotomy, I, I don't think I'd do that unless they had more arthritis. You know, he has an isolated lesion that you could treat with however you like to treat your OCDs. But I think in this case, I, I would, I agree with Gabriel. I would like to add that I'll try to avoid the calcosteotomy unless it is um, absolutely necessary. So meaning that you, you see that there is a meaningful difference between the healthy side and the disease side. Because uh, I try to not to touch the hind foot axis in an OCD, at least in the primary surgery. And for me, that will be another good indication to do some type of augmentation with using like an internal brace and then see what happens. So because we all know that uh, most uh, sportsmen, they it's hard for them to recover from an axis changing surgery. So. It, I guess it depends on, on the patient that we're talking of, but if it's a high demand patient or it's a, a sports player, I will try to avoid the, the calcoxiotomy if, if I can get away uh, just by doing my ankle scope and then augmentation with uh, the internal brace. Hey guys, Thank in the for... setting of a chronic ATFL and CFL tear, are any of you guys doing any non anatomic reconstructions like Christmas Snook or anything like that? No, not me. No, no. I, I think there is enough evidence in the literature that uh, a classical brossum ghoul with any of its modifications is strong enough and doesn't have the morbidity you add when you add a, when you do, when you do some of the non anatomical techniques like a Christmas and Snook, Evans or whatever. The only thing that you get is a very stiff ankle that is of course corrects the instability, but you have more comorbidities and more stiffness. So that's why most people are moving back or moving away from the non anatomical techniques, I think. Sorry, I missed uh, part of the thing. I, I was disconnected for a few moments. So um, I would like to ask um, if any of you um, would ever perform, the, because this is what we actually did in this case, an osteotomy of the first metatarsal, a calcaneal osteotomy. This was not done minimally invasive. Now I would do it minimally invasive and we reconstructed the ligaments. And um, the thing is, will you do the same for these guys? Who would do an osteotomy correction in an OCD or in an ankle instability? 
I would not do it. How about you, Eric? Would you consider? Um, I think this, just what we, I, I agree with the, how you guys treated that case. I, I think that for most people, you know, because that, that was going on to, you know, the start of arthritis, of Aris arthritis that we would see 10 years later. But somebody who's in the height of their their career, um, it, I I wouldn't I would I would treat whatever their initial problem is, and then say when your your career is over, come back. And and we spoke a little bit about that last night too with James Calder because he sees a lot of the Premier League players. But um, you know, uh, I just you want to be less aggressive um, in these in these folks because. Typically, these athletes, these high-level athletes, they'll they'll train through whatever they have and get back to it. So you just keep them on the pathway. Eric, um, you know, I don't see as many high-level athletes as as you do. Uh, so I I totally agree with what you guys are saying. But uh, um, in I would say in the in more of the patients that I see, the standard patients that are not like I, I could see how this would be a problem in a high level athlete where you mess with the you know the their alignment that they've had all their life basically um, but I think in in my standard uh, uh, patient in Jacksonville you know uh, if if you don't correct this deformity they the you're uh, you're going to be more apt to fail your your lateral ligament repair because uh, you know they're going to just tear it up again you know that that's a very good point because it's not black or white probably very few people would do osteotomies in these kind of athletes but for the rest the the average people that we see that practice a lot of sports we would be more prone into correcting the alignment i guess we will all agree especially if there is some, some asymmetric deformity because when, when it is completely symmetric, it's very hard to uh, justify that you're correcting something that is similar on the other side that has no symptoms. So when there is a little bit of, of asymmetric deformity, I think it's much easier to, um, uh, to do it. Uh, let me move into the last issue. We have uh, five minutes. I'm going to move very quickly into a patient who came to see me. He had an injury. He's a 30 years old uh, guy from Argentina, very active. Uh, and he had an injury in 2012 and someone reattached his posterior tibial tendon. Uh, and this is the guy, he allowed me to show all these pictures. He actually collected every, every picture for me. And uh, he had this avulsion and they reattached that with, uh, with a screw and probably some sutures. But he continued to have, he was complaining about, not complaining about the foot itself. He was complaining about the knee and the hip. And these are the pictures he collected himself, a very obsessive engineer. Uh, and he was complaining about this. So people in Argentina were very confused about what to do because he was seeing a foot surgeon in order to correct the knee and the hip. And if you take a closer look, you're going to see that he does not have a, a classic flat foot that you may see after a chronic medial uh, ligament injury. He actually has a cavus varus foot that's, that is a little bit asymmetric. So if you consider the injured side, he, you're going to see that it's a little bit uh, less of a cavus is very subtle but he is actually flattening his arch and going into valgus that's not really a valgus it's less varus and less high arch on that side so uh, this is a chronic uh, medial ankle instability so i would like to know how would you treat it and how about considering combination of bony and medial soft tissue procedures? Uh, I'm going to show you what I did because there's no trick here. Uh, I did the lateral column length lengthening, as you see there, and then I reconstructed the medial ligaments and added an internal brace. And these are the pictures he took. 
This is his pre-injury situation, his post-injury situation, and this is what he looks uh, with uh, wavering X-rays. So lateral ligament, I mean lateral column lengthening, uh, like this, and uh, he's doing much better right now. So what would you have done differently, or you would have done the same, Gabriel? This is a very special case because I came out with my own conclusion that the subtle loss of the uh, previous shape of the foot was changing into a more flattening situation, but he didn't have actually a flat foot or a significant valgus. It was very subtle when you compare that with the contralateral side. Uh, Gabriel. You know, I'm a big fan for osteotomies, to, you know, to protect these corrections, but maybe in this patient, Christian, I don't know, maybe I would give it a try just with the uh, internal brace and just, just, you know, try to repair the ligament and, and see how it goes. I, I didn't see a gross uh, valgus deformity like going in his, in his uh, hand foot. So I, I might have tried without the osteotomy maybe. To, to be honest, he was complaining of the abduction because he has all the complaints in his mind and written in his computer. So he was complaining that the foot was externally <laughs> rotated. So I didn't want to miss that. But I completely agree with the point that in a subtle or some medial chronic instability, you may just reconstruct the medial side. What do you think, George? I, I agree minutes. with what Gabriel said. I, I think that, um, you know, uh, not messing with the bony alignment in, in this situation where there, there wasn't gross deformity or whatever, there wasn't severe, you know, uh, hind foot valgus that, you know, um, uh, I would have tried a, a more of a soft tissue uh, procedure. Great. Manuel? Christian, I have a question for you. Sure. So you have taught me how to do arthrosis. Why didn't you choose that? <laughs> <laughs> because at that point, that was done uh, like six years ago. And at that point, I was not a big fan of arthrosis in adults. Now, I may have thought about it. I maybe I would change and I would do the arthrosis and delta repair. I think uh, that's, that's a, a good, very good question. For this for this case, it will be um, uh, a good indication. All right, great. Cool. How about you, Eric? Oh, Eric, you had like, I know you're like George. I, I agree. I would put on the the. I would do an internal brace. The only thing to consider also in some of these is whether or not they have Achilles tightening, because um, you saw in that lateral pre-op that. There was a little bit of Aquinas. All right. Cool. Do you well, like, do you like, uh, sorry, so sorry, Christian. That was an interesting case to end on, but we've got to keep things moving. So yes. uh, thanks you guys. Um, to keep tuning in for the last two sessions. Um, you, we'll be back in a few minutes. Thanks, Celine. Thank you, Celine. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Great discussion, guys. The rest of the weekend. Good evening, everybody. Good evening.